Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, give us um, minds to understand and hearts and lives to obey. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to begin a, a little bit differently than I oftentimes do. I want to go directly to Psalm 119. Psalm many of you will be familiar with. I, ju I just want to start by hearing these words this morning. This is Psalm 119, beginning in verse 1. The psalmist writes, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. And oh, that, they, oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart, the psalmist says, as I learn your righteous laws. And the entire, the entire psalm goes, goes on like this. In fact, this is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, 176 verses, and it's connecting the, the knowledge and the understanding of, of God's way, of, of his design for how we are to live with the application of that in our lives, of that truth. And he connects it all to the experience of what the psalmist refers to as, as blessing or literally translated of, of, of happiness. And then the psalmist just goes on and he just expressively praises God for this experience, this blessed experience of obedience to his word. And for him, the, the train of thought here seems to be somewhat pragmatic, right? The, the psalmist, as he's talking about how he's seeking to know and understand and to live according to God's word, is his praise to God who created all of this seems to be rooted in, at least in part, in the fact that it works. That in his experience of, of living in relationship with God, following his way for him, it, it works. It leads him to a place that is good, and he's, he's, he's praising God because it's effective. Of course, we all know that, that the opposite of that can also be true. There are times when we choose not to obey God's word, not to do things in the way that he taught us to do, and the result of that is generally ends up being not good. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you've given somebody very clear instructions on how something is to be done, this is the way you do it, and then they totally go out and ignore you, right? And, and it might ultimately get done, maybe, but oftentimes the path that, that gets there is painful and the result isn't all that great. When I was a, a high school pastor here, we would take our students up to Baraboo, Wisconsin for our annual winter retreat and the kids would go skiing and they, they loved it and it was a, so much fun. And, and I would oftentimes go over to the ski slope to the bunny hill to work with the beginners at the outset of the day. Mr. Wong, you, you were there with me. We're trying to teach the kids some of the basics, right? Some of the principles of how you, how you ski and some of the, the things they need to know in order to be safe. And you try to teach them how to wedge their skis so they can control their speed. And you, you teach them to bend their knees. And, and, and you say, if you're getting a little out of control, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're going too fast, just lay yourself over. Just lay yourself down. You can stop. And we'll meet you there, we'll get you back up, and we'll talk about how you did and, and get you going. But nine times out of ten, and this is not, this is not like, a, I don't, I, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's just like they would get up, they'd see the hill in front of them, their eyes would get wide, and everything that we just told them left their brain. And I can remember one time in particular, this, this student just got going downhill and the main thing you try to emphasize if you're feeling out of control just lay yourself over like you're not going to get hurt we can come meet you there that that did not register and so he's going down the hill and at the bottom of the bunny hill there's all these people 
mingling around, and instead of sort of laying himself down, he just starts to shout, like, look out, look out. Like, I'm, he's just a, he's a projectile at this point in time. And, and people are kind of like getting out of the way, and then there's this uh, snow fence, right? It's meant to kind of be a last measure of, of defense, and yet there's one spot where there's like a gate that, that was open. And he's just perfectly lining right towards that opening. And then on the other side of that, the, the, the snow fence, there's like a berm that, you know, is, is just kind of between the, the hill and the parking lot. And that berm basically just launches him, right? He's, now he's not, not only does he not know how to ski, he's ski jumping. And he, he lands in the parking lot and we kind of like, he disappears behind the berm. There's ski poles flying everywhere. And, and there's this explosion of snow, and then you just kind of hear this voice in the distance go, I'm okay, you know, like. <laughs> and, and we get him up and dust him off and, and take him back up the hill and like, let's go over the basics again, right? Like, here's how you fall over. Here, we, we know intuitively and experientially the results that, that come with not doing something according to its design. Not, not operating the way that, that we're designed to operate. See, today as we continue in our summer series entitled The Disciplines of Grace, we're going we're gonna to look at the discipline of what we're just referring to as obeying, the discipline of obeying. Or if I could say it more directly, simply doing what God says as, as a spiritual discipline. And even as I say that, that may sound basic or entry level. But I, I can tell you from my years of pastoral experience and, and really more so from my years of, of journeying with Jesus in my own personal faith, that as basic or as obvious or as simple as obedience may sound, it's much easier said than done. Or this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is where I struggle. Right? I've said things at times. Maybe you've heard me. Where it's like, you say things maybe in a Bible study or, or whatever. You say, you know, I just, I love to go deep into God's Word. I really love to get into like the meaty part of the text. I love to like talk about the Greek and, and, and really think about the context. And all of that is, is really good. We, we should absolutely do that. I'm a fan of that. I love to do that. But more often than not, if, if I am being totally honest with myself, the point of struggle for me is not that I need to understand more information. It's, it's acting on what I've already understood. I, I don't, it could be good for me to spend more time in the Greek understanding the nature of love and compassion and generosity or hospitality, but where I struggle is acting on what I already know living it out in obedience to what I've been taught. Perhaps you can relate to this. James, who is the brother of Jesus, he's a leader in the early church, and he is incredibly passionate about faith um, being more in our lives than mental assent. It, it's more than understanding. It, it has to manifest itself, according to James, in obedience. It has to be lived out in action. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to James chapter 1. It's no surprise then, given that, that, that James has something to say about the nature and practice and experience of obedience. So I'm going to pick things up in James chapter 1. We're going to look, we're going to read uh, verses 19 through 25. So we're kind of midstream of thought here for James. And he says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away 
and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks, at him, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now James here, as he's emphasizing this, this action, the, the response of obedience, there's a couple things that, that he points out here that I want us to consider. And first is that he begins with a clear warning. James begins at the point of a clear warning. He says in verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. And he follows it up with this, this illustration that he gives about the mirror and, and going and becoming aware of taking in this information about your condition and your need and then leaving that and immediately forgetting what you just saw. When I was uh, on a mission trip in Puerto Rico, we were staying at this real small church. Um, the kids had mattresses strewn out on the floor and and there was just enough bathroom space. It was only two little bathrooms. And so they said, the girls, uh, you guys can use the indoor bathrooms. And then for the boys, they brought in some porter potties and put them outside. And the, the one thing about a porter potty, not, not the one thing actually, one of the things <laughs> about a porter potty is that they don't, they don't have mirrors in them. And so I'm doing work, we're, we're going throughout the week, and I am, am, for the most part, never in the course of this week really getting a good look at myself. Um, and, and I remember at the end of the trip, I, we took the students to the airport. I was leaving on a flight the next day to go meet some of our other students in Mexico or Ecuador. I can't remember where I was flying to, but I had a flight the next day, so I, I got a hotel. And I, the first clue should have been when I was, I was walking through the lobby and people were looking at me kind of strangely. But I didn't really register. I check in and I go up to my room and walk into the bathroom. And for the first time in a week, I got a good look at myself. And it was not pretty. Um, my hair was all over the place. This, I was, this is back when I used to shave. And my beard was scraggly looking. And I had paint on my shorts. There was a tear and my t-shirt, right? I, I, I was a mess. But it's one thing for me to become aware of this. It would have been another thing if, if I would have left there and completely forgotten this information that I'd just taken in about myself and gone and made a reservation at the finest restaurant in San Juan, right? Th this is the point that James is, is making here. He begins this text by this, this, these moral imperatives, these instructions and teachings that he wants to give to the church here. This church that's been scattered out of Jerusalem as a result of persecution. They're enduring difficult times. And he says, I want you to be quick to listen. I, wa I want you to be slow to speak, slow to become angry. I want you to get rid of all the moral filth and the, the evil that he says is so prevalent. I want you to humbly accept the word that's been planted in you. I want you to, to humbly accept the transformative truth of the gospel. He said, well, that's which can save you, James says. And immediately following this instruction to the church, he says, but be careful. Be careful that, that you don't just hear this, that you don't even just take it in and and understand it and then walk out of this place and do nothing with it. James says that that would be the equivalent of looking into a mirror, understanding the truth about yourself, the con your condition and your need, and then walking away and, and completely forgetting what you've just seen. Essentially, James is, is, is teaching us that hearing God's word alone. Remember, the early church would gather together. They would be the public reading of, of Scripture. So he's picturing them hearing this together. And he says, if, if you just are there and you just hear it, he's saying that's not sufficient. That isn't, that isn't the end game. To hear truth and not act on it, James is teaching the church, we're essentially lying to ourselves. It's as if we're looking in a mirror and then walking away and completely forgetting what we've seen. So James says, don't be deceived, church. Don't, don't hear and know and understand truth and then, and then leave and live your life as if nothing's changed. 
See, for years when I would read the book of James, maybe you can, maybe you're similar. I thought, I thought James appeared harsh. That sometimes his directive to people who are dealing with suffering and persecution, that, he, that it was um, a bit intense and, and lacked grace. And that sometimes he just, I thought he came across as just kind of an angry guy. And then the more I've read this letter and the more I've looked at what he's trying to communicate to this early church and the experience that they're having, is that he's he's not just this curmudgeon. This is the heart of a pastor who is desperately trying to see the people under his care live in and experience the fullness of the life that Jesus has made possible, that he has made available to them. He he doesn't want them to just know about him. He wants them to to experience it. He wants the transformative truth of of God's word to be their reality. And he says it with passion as he communicates it. See, James understands that there are competing authorities vying for their time and attention. These systems of understanding are operating. There's what Paul refers to in Romans 12 as as the pattern of this world. This is the normative way that we operate in our everyday lives outside of the transformative work of of God's grace. Where we are our own greatest authority, where the end objective ultimately is about what's best for us. And this is what is normal to us. It's what we are born into. But what James understands and what he wants the church to understand is that it's a a spiritual Ponzi scheme of sorts. It promises all these great things. You might even experience some, some early returns, and yet at the end of the day, it leaves you empty and destitute and alone. So then James says, but there's also a second way. There's the way of Jesus. There's this this upside down kingdom that he taught us about and and it might sound to us to be so counterintuitive where the the first will be last and the last first where the the greatest among us is going to be a servant of all It, it might even sound too good to be true that there's grace and forgiveness available outside of what we earn for ourselves outside of anything that we do to accomplish that that jesus has done that on our behalf But he's saying this way, this way of Jesus, how he has taught us to live, this is what leads us to life, James says. What Jesus himself in John chapter 10 calls the full life. And he begins this, he begins with a warning. He says, don't don't deceive yourselves. Don't, church, don't fall for it, this pattern of this world. Don't, Don't merely hear the truth of God's perfect way and then go live according to the pattern of this world because it doesn't lead to life and he wants more for the church. So his clear warning that this James gives us here, it's followed by a very simple and yet a clear call. What do do we do in light of this? James is, does not mix words. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, James writes. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James is is overt in his instruction to us. He says, do what it says. When a... I take my family, um, we have a tradition of going down to North Myrtle Beach in South Carolina for a family vacation. Been doing that since I was a kid. And several years ago, when my kids were much smaller, uh, we were down at the beach and, and I was playing with my youngest kind of in the shallow water. I was maybe just kind of like calf deep in, in the water, right kind of up on the beach. And my two oldest kids were out in the waves with my mom and they were on their boogie boards and, and trying to ride the waves. and. We're just playing and having fun. And as I'm there with my daughter, I see kind of swim between where I'm at and where my oldest girls are at, my mom is at, uh, like a four-foot shark. 
And, um, and it was also like right coming up to Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. So I just seen like all these commercials where there's like a great white eating something. And, and like any of us in that moment, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of, of panic, right? So I, I get Naomi quickly in and I start to head out to the older girls. And at the same time, I'm instructing them, I need you to come in. And they're just out there having the time of their lives with their grandma. They're having fun and they're riding their boogie boards and they're kind of looking at me like, like, Dad, we're totally fine. Like, what, what, what's going on? And I kind of get that face that parents can get um, where you're saying, I'm not, I'm not asking you. But I, I said, get out of the water now. And you could kind of then be like, okay, he means business, right? Like, we don't know what's going on. But they start to come to me, and I grab them and lift them up in my arms, and I, I, I walk them to safety. And, and, and what I needed for them in that moment was to understand that that I had information that they didn't have, and that I understood and saw some things that they didn't see. And I was asking them to act, to respond, based on my love for them, my loving relationship for them. Will you obey me because I love you, and I see some things, and I know some things, and I want you to act in response to that? See, this is the picture of obedience that James is giving for us. And there's a, there's a couple of things that I just want to highlight about the nature of obedience, about how we understand it, how we perceive it. First is that James, J, James teaches us that obedience, it, it, it starts with knowledge and, and understanding, right? He, James is not diminishing in any way the importance of encountering and being taught by God's word. In, in fact, he emphasizes it. If you look again at verse 25 in, in this passage, three times James, as he's making this point, will, will instruct us about the importance. He says, but whoever looks intently, whoever's reading it, understanding, looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, continues in it, okay, so it goes back to it, reviews it, not forgetting what they've heard, who also then remembers it, but doing it, right? So three times before he gets to the point of action, James emphasizes that this begins with an encounter with God's word. The, the psalmist in Psalm 119 says it this way. He says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, our obedience is, is, is it's built on an understanding of what God has instructed us to do. He, he's taught us to live what, he, what we're equipped with through the teaching and the reading of God's word. And James is, he is emphatic on this point. But he's saying it doesn't end there. That is not the end game. The end, the end game is not our understanding. The outworking of our understanding is when we put it into action, when it's displayed in our lives. The second thing about obedience for James is that obedience recognizes a greater authority. Obedience recognizes a greater authority. Obedience, by definition, is an act of submission to a greater authority than ourselves. And if we had time this morning, there's, there's a ton that we could unpack here. But, but I, even when I was working on this for the sermon, I could feel that part in my heart where it was sort of like, recoils to this, that part of my human nature that still wants to sort of plant myself as the ultimate say of my own life. And, and, and obedience recognizes and responds to something. There is one who is greater than I, who is a, an authority on how I am to live. I, I simply want to, um, in Philippians chapter 2, again, there's a ton that we could say here. I just want to point us to the example of Jesus, though. In, G in Philippians chapter 2, he says, In your relationship with one another, this is verse 5 now, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God to be used for his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Verse 8 now, he says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. So Jesus, who was fully God, fully divine, who, who participated in the creation of the universe and in the creation of us, 
who I have, if, if you're here this morning and you would identify yourself as a follower of Jesus, who I have said is the model and the example that I want to pattern my life after, if he was willing to submit himself to the will of the Father to the point of death on a cross, for ultimately for our benefit, for our salvation, then that's not too much to ask of me. That, that, that is not a bridge too far to ask of me. If, if my Savior was willing to model this to us in a response to, to the will of the Father. Which, and this is the third thing about obedience that I just want to real quickly point out. Is that obedience is ultimately relational. It, the, the question that this really boils down to for me is, is do I trust myself or do I trust the one who's asking me to obey? Do, do I trust the authority that I'm at being asked to submit to? Just earlier in, in the book of James, in chapter 1, James again says this. He says, do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. All right? If you go back to that moment on the beach with my kids, when, when I am asking them out of, of what kind of father in that moment, right, would have said, I'm sure they'll be fine. Like, I'm gonna, they'll take their chances. They seem to be having fun with grandma out in the waves right now, right? No, of course not. Lo a loving father in that moment is going to ask them to respond despite the fact that they don't understand everything that I am seeing in that moment. This is, this is what God is doing for us. It is a loving Father who is asking us to trust Him, who designed us, who created us, who understands and knows what is best for us in our lives. And He's saying, do you trust me enough? Do you trust me enough to obey me? Is that relationship there? See, obedience is, is relational. And this ultimately leaves us with with James kind of third and, and final emphasis in these verses, and that is a clear result. A clear result. Again, verse 25. But whoever looks into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Richard Foster, who wrote the book, A Celebration of Discipline, is a, it's an excellent resource on all these things that we've been talking about these this summer, but he talks about how each of these disciplines that he's teaching, that there is a, a corresponding freedom that, that, that results in it, a correlating freedom. And in his chapter on, on the discipline of submission, or as we've been talking about it, the discipline of, of obedience, he begins his chapter by talking about this corresponding freedom, and he says this, he says, it's, it's not in the discipline itself, he says their value is a means of setting us before God so that he gives us the liberation that we seek. He says the liberation is the end. The disciplines are merely the means. So this is, this is what James is teaching us here. This is what he's providing for us. It, it's the liberation that we seek and that we discover in it is, is, is not some misguided belief that we can act and live according to what you and I determine to be best for ourselves. In fact, Scripture, Paul actually refers to that as slavery in our lives. But freedom, the, the blessing that both James and, and the psalmist talk about, he's saying that is discovered, it's a result of, of obedience to God's design and his authority in our life. See, this, this, the freedom and the blessing that James described is not, it's not the promise of ease. Not, it's not the promise that your life and my life is going to be comfortable or that it's even going to be preferable. In fact, again, the early ch the church that James is writing this to is experiencing some incredibly difficult times right now. But the promise that, that he's teaching us, the freedom that he wants us to experience is the freedom of a life that is lived in alignment with our design and in relationship with our designer. We were made for a relationship with God because he loves us and we experience it when we trust him enough to obey him, to simply do what he says. 
we actually, in that moment, it's actually there that we stop carrying the incredibly heavy and cumbersome burden of our own will, and we begin to discover the freedom of his. I, uh, as I wrap up, I had a, a student um, who, this is years ago when I was in Wheaton, and, and you track over social media and stuff some of what's happening in people's lives, and so I had some familiarity with what was going on in her life, and just kind of back and forth, and she was out in California doing her thing, living her life, and then I, I began to notice just by the tone of kind of what she was posting that there had been a, a spiritual awakening in her life, a, a transformative moment. And, and I, so I started just to kind of follow this. At this point, I still hadn't reached out or said anything, but she actually ended up moving back to Chicago. She's going to seminary to, to study. And, and so eventually I reached out and I discovered that, that her and another friend, she's in her late 20s, early 30s now, had started this podcast where they're taking all of these cultural issues and, and they're just trying to look at it from the context of, of God's word and understand, well, what does God teach us about these things? And on one of those podcasts, she shares her story. She talks about um, what, what went on in her life. She talks about how in this season in her late 20s, God just kind of brought her to the end of herself. And, and she would say, I think she would say, I really, really understood the gospel for the first time in, in her life. And she responded in faith. And she said, what happened from that point was a transition of, of thinking, I want to do things my way and, and, and according to what I determined to be best, to what she would call the joy of obedience. Where she discovered that, that joy and freedom for her was, was found in following God's perfect way. And now her passion, her desire, because she looks at her own generation and she says, we have bought into in so many ways this, this, this either this partial understanding of our faith where we kind of have one foot in and one foot out and we're just, we're not experiencing this full life that Jesus talks about that he wants to bring. And, and yet she talks about how she wants them to discover. She wants people her age, and really anyone, but she's talking to an audience in her own generation. She said, I want you to discover what I discovered. I want you to discover that joy is found in obedience to what God has for us. Beginning with the point of surrender to the, to the gospel, the surrender of grace and forgiveness, and then trusting him with what he's taught us about how to live our life. Because he knows because he designed us, he created us, and he loves us, and he's good. See, all of this is rooted for James and for us in the character of God and understanding that he is good. And so my prayer this morning is the same for us as her prayer is for her generation, that we would know the joy and the freedom what the psalmist talks about as, as blessing that's found in obedience to the loving God who created us for a relationship with him. This morning, as we, as we wrap up, each week this summer, we've been closing with a challenge. And if you look up on the screen, there's a, a list of, of everywhere we've been so far this summer. Some of the challenges, some of the practices that we've been talking about and the corresponding challenge. And if you're anything like me, there's some of those challenges that when we, we put them up there, you're kind of like, yeah, that's great. I, I, I think I'll benefit from that. And there might be others, when it got put up there, you were like, no thanks, right? Here's the challenge this week. I want you to go back to that one that was a no thanks. I, I want you to trust him enough to say, I'm, I'm going to meet you in this. Maybe it's, maybe it's what J Pastor Jeff talked about last week. Maybe it's that idea of, of forgiveness, right? Of letting go of, of that um, burden that you carry of something that's been done wrong to you. Maybe it's hospitality. Maybe when we talked about opening up your table and your home to, to people around you as a tangible expression of God's love and compassion, you were like, yeah, you know. What one was it for you? Because here, here's the thing. My, my true, my sincere belief is that on the other side of obedience, there is a freedom that is waiting for you, that God wants you to experience and he wants you to live in and he wants you to know. And the question that remains is, do I trust the one 
who's asking me to obey. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time to be together. We thank you for your word that you teach us and that you open our eyes up to the, the way that you have taught us to live. May we know you, may we love you, and may we respond in obedience to your love for us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.